Okay, hello, one more time. Welcome to Dijkstra for our next talk. Is it legal for state and institutions to collect and publish data for ethnic minorities and which consequences will that have for the people affected by this? Those are some of the questions that the following talk will address. Specifically, they're talking about the crime statistics by the Berlin police um, where Sinti and Roma are linked to specific criminal acts. This is a population group that's already stigmatized very strongly anyway. Um, how problematic these ways of data collection are, this is what Leah Backman and Anja Reuss will be talking about. Um, Anja Reuss is a political referent um, for the Central Council of German Sinti and Roma about topics such as anti-Egypticism um, and racial profiling. Leah Beckmann is um, a lawyer and works at the Society for Civil Rights with a focus um, on the protection of civil and basic rights. Well, and in that sense, um, I'd ask for a warm round of applause for Anja Reuss and Leah Beckmann. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for this welcome. I'm really happy to, that there are so many people who came for this that are interested in this topic. And I think it's also the first time for anyone to be talking about anti-gypsicism um, at Congress. And that's what I'm especially happy about because I think it's extremely important for us to get wider reach for this topic and these issues. Um, in the beginning, I, it was already mentioned that there's a long tradition of data collection for Sinti and Roma, um, and I will give a brief historical overview over this later on. So I will do that because you haven't done that so far. So there will be a quick historical overview over how this data collection grew historically because I think it's important to get a sense of how this is being practiced today. Um, at the very least, Sinti and Roma have always been framed as a security problem, have always been presumed guilty by association and put under general suspicion. But because we have very little time, we basically used two examples that we want to use it as highlights and as examples to show what this practice or police practice, policing practice looks like. But basically, it's important to bear in mind that these are just highlights and examples, and we have some links for further information if you're interested in that. So maybe just for starters as well, what you can see here is a population polling that the Le Leipzig University did and that was in its authoritarianism study um, in 2018 and it's very ob pretty obvious in this study that people's aversion to Sinti and Roma in the population is pretty widely spread and that the assumption that Sinti and Roma tend to be criminals, um, this assumption is very high. Why is that the case? That has different, has different reasons. Anti-gypsicism basically has deep roots in society, so that's an important reason, but it's also due to how police frames this ethnic minority. And maybe for starters, why it's apparently relevant for the police and why they're doing this, why they claim that they're collecting data on Sinti and Roma in the first place, is that they claim that Sinti and Roma are generally more prone to commit crimes. Um, they claim that p the police, um, or that at least the police assumes that they have some kind of expert knowledge about crimes and criminality among Sinti and Roma and how it happens and how it uh, manifests itself manifest itself. And that's also something that you can very much see in the historical, that's also something that's very relevant for the historical part that we'll talk about later. And then in addition to that, the police also assumes that what they, the group people who they frame as gypsies, the this racist concept, um, that they also assume that you can somehow recognize people by just looking at them, just looking at the exterior. 
And yeah, so hello from me as well. I just wanted to give a quick introduction to the legal ba basics for this so you can understand my perspective on this because we at the civil so at the um, Society for Civil, so civil Rights, we are a human rights organization and we are different from other organizations because we, for example, um, strategically pick cases that we try to get to the courts where we think that you can um, implement and enforce human rights by going to court and taking cases to court. One of the reasons we're working together with the Central Council of German Sinti and Roma is because we're working on these human rights issues. So in the context of policing with regards to Sinti and Roma, one thing that's extremely important is that the international there's an international law that is banning racist um, policing, essentially. So that's use Kogans, which means it's compelling law. Um, so even if there was an international treaty, uh, this law could not be undermined or ever been gotten rid of. So it's a very basic right. Um, it's also a part of the German basic law, and it has specific implications for the work of the police. So po whenever the police has some kind of discretion in making decisions, they're still bound by basic rights um, and human rights. And this is where essentially this ban on racial profiling is especially there because they cannot act based on the assumption, based on racist assumption and racist prejudice. So they cannot assume that someone's color, like color of their skin um, or how their color of their skin interacts with their, um, their behavior. They cannot make these assumptions and use them to, for example, conclude that a particular person might be more likely to have committed or um, to commit crimes in the future. Um, in addition to these operative uh, requirements, it's also important with regards to data collection that is being done by the police. Uh, because, for example, they might help uh, investigations by pre uh, prepare investigations by collecting data, and this is also something that's specifically laid down in the law because it says that any markers that are related to race are a particular category of personally identifiable data, so there's a red flag. These data can only be collected in very specific, uh, unique cases. So it's absolutely banned to, um, to collect race in a structurally and broad-based uh, analyzable way. So you cannot just collect data for everyone in Germany who, for example, is part of Sinti and Roma or another ethnic group. In addition to that, it also means that in particular contexts, so for example, police can collect data if it's if it's absolutely important and absolutely necessary for uh, preventing um, a danger, like a particular danger, or for investigating a particular crime. But so only if it's necessary for those investigations. So that also means that if there is a concrete and specific suspicion, um, and they're looking for and um, they're looking for someone, they can collect that person's color of skin. But if if they, for example, just assume that someone who's part of Sinti and Roma is more li likely to commit a crime, then they cannot just use that as an assumption to assume that someone is more likely to commit a crime. Um, and so that's something that they cannot mention in a police in a policing file for a particular case. That's something that they only allow to talk about and use in very few cases. So our thesis is, however, that practical policing looks very different. And our practical assumption um, that we also um, want to present here a bit is that how things work, in our opinion, is that people who are allegedly Sinti and Roma um, are much more likely to be victims of racial profiling and be subject of police enforcement actions, such as um, checking identity documents. And then in those contexts, the police will essentially mark down in their files that these people, um, that the people who they watched or enforced something on, that they assume that these people are part of Sinti and Roma and said that there is a collection of data on alleged Sinti and Roma, which is then in turn um, used as the basis for investigations, which are essentially happening on the basis of racist prejudices. As I mentioned, there's a pretty long historical tradition within the police. And this is also something that goes f further back than even National Socialism in the Third Reich. It had its kind of high point uh, under the Nazis, but this practice, this policing practice is way older. So the concept of quote-unquote gypsies is something that ap first appeared in the early 18th century. Um, and at, at the time in the empire, 
the first types of data were already systematically collected. And then under the Nazis, that data was used to deport these members of this ethnic minority and murder them, um, as opposed to the Jews who, who are also victims of National Socialism, who essentially experienced kind of like a change with a more moves against anti-Semitism post-World War II. There was no such change with regards to anti-Gypsicism and the fate of sentient Roma, which simply this discrimination only transformed gradually and slowly. What's important is that Sinti and Roma have always been framed as people with un undesirable behavior, um, as strangers that are outside of society, even if they are German citizens. And this framing them as a security, as a problem of security and public order, and that's something that's oh, they're always being accused of, and that's then used as the basis for justifying that you have to collect data about them and have to collect more information about them. In 1899, the Munich Police Department even created a, a gypsies, uh, gypsy central, quote unquote. Quote, which basically published the first so-called gypsy book in 1905, which had data on 3,000 people in there, including their family trees and other personal data. And this is the type of data that was they continued to collect, which was then used during the national, under National Socialism. This institution essentially moved into the security administration and the Administration 5, or Amt 5, then continued this data collection and pa also passed it on to, a, uh, to an office that was concerned with hy uh, hy hygienic race research, um, which then used that to kill, murder people. Um, in 1938, um, they had information on 30, 30, 31,000 people, which basically was everyone who was part of Sinti and Roma um, at the time. For all of them, they had fingerprints, pictures, um, genealogies, and personal other personal data. Um, as I mentioned earlier, this tradition continued post-1945, basically without any significant breaks. Um, right after 1945, the police created new so-called gypsy police departments right after 1945 that continued working in the same ways using the same data, but to kind of hide and this anti-gypsicism a bit, they were renamed in 1953 into a data collection um, uh, for people who uh, they were renamed into civil registry for annotations. And so this is one of the publications from Lower Saxony where it's also where it's essentially laying down guidelines for what is supposed to be collected and under what conditions. In 1970, this new registry was considered anti unconstitutional, but the practice essentially continued. This is because from the 1980s onwards, um, the federal criminal agency started collecting data on Sinti and Roma and also had a specific part within the institution um, that had it was working was collecting dedicated data about Sinti and Roma and essentially and essentially answered questions for questions and qu requests from the different states that came to them and did this for the entire country. So that's where the uh, state criminal agencies came to ask questions about s people who they thought were Sinti and Roma and committed crimes. And so here we have. Uh, Essentially, here we have kind of like a file that shows, um, that gives you information about someone that police is uh, looking for. And here you can say that in their personal data, there is something that they're collecting is um, that they are considered a quote unquote gypsy, even though they're not using that particular name. But at this, but then because there were protests, 
by the Central Council of Sinti and Roma. This was abolished at the time. And then it was simply changed. So um, from 1984 onwards, they stopped using the term gypsy and they replaced another euphemism. Um, and then they replaced that with uh, a, the framing HWAO, which basically, which is essentially the same meaning, but essentially just means someone often changes their place of residence. So they just use different words, but the basic framing and assumptions have essentially remained the same throughout time. And because this collection of um, so-called gypsy names was, abol was supposed to be abolished, the police essentially started collecting other types of information and used different words to kind of mark people as Sinti and Roma without using the terminology they'd, they'd used before. And the police was extremely creative in doing this and had a range of different terms that they used for this that they've been using since the 1980s to essentially mark Sinti and Roma. And that's also something that continues into the present. So these are two requests from Baden-Württemberg, which is a state in southern Germany, um, from and from Saxony, where it became very, there from 2014 to 2016 respectively, where it became very obvious that police are still using similar framings, uh, such as this person often changes their location of residence. And ours, we assume that this is essentially a category that is probably being used to collect data on Sinti and Roma. Um, be, when being asked about this repeatedly in Saxony, uh, police basically stopped answering questions and it's impossible to get, quite, like, get further answers about what exactly this category is doing. We now want to show you two examples. How does this work? How can you register Sinti and Roma? We only have these um, personalized, personalized um, data and the state databases have these kinds of um, terminology that can't be used that have been in identified as racist. So one term that they're not using anymore is, for example, this HWAO term. Um, in some other places, we don't know what type of uh, terms they use. Um, as Anna already said, in uh, Baden-Württemberg, they essentially continue to use this terminology. And so we were essentially wondering how is this practice being continued today and one assumption that we have is that uh, the category traveling criminals that officially um, only collects cases where the person who committed a crime doesn't live where the crime was committed but that we think that if that is combined with additional information, such as um, a member of a mobile ethnic community, those, that's kind of terminology that people are using, then it's very clear for, for police men and police women that basically these are coded as Sinti and Roma and that there is a particular suspicion towards them. But we also see this as an example that this mark, marking people as Sinti and Roma continues. And this is also something that appears in crime statistics. Um, I don't know who of you have left looked at those statistics before. So statistically taken where criminality is um, being followed. So this exists on a country like on a county site but also on a country level. So um, the police is in charge of this. Like obviously it's only registered where police is actually investigating but um, there's a few points of interest where we can understand this. So this, I'm going to give you some examples of what actually happened in these kind of incidences. Historically, um, we have these statistics by the police, this marking or labeling of Sinti and Roma. This is from 1953, traveling um, criminals perpetrator. Okay, there we had it. So the definition of the um, traveler, travelers are people that um, due to origin are traveling from place to place, usually um, in caravans and are traveling in the country in these and do not have a permanent place of residency. And um, if they do have um, 
this even if they have a permanent place of residence, the, the, the assumption is that they do not get rid of this um, marker of being part of the traveling community. So it's basically genetically based racism, but assumes that once you're part of this community, you're always part of this community. So I'm giving this example. Um, there's other examples. I'm just going to give you one. Um, this criminal statistics by the police from Frankfurt from 2005. We have this section. So criminal acts from um, people who belong to mobile ethnic minorities, like again, once again, we find these kind of labeling or marking that traces back to being racist. Um, in 2007, we again see this, how this is continued as a tradition in the investigation. So investigations were targeted towards specific ethnic groups. So this sort of like racist investigation is obviously a great danger of this. How do we uh, came to work together? So obviously, like also in the um, in, in Berlin, also they had like 86 um, perpetrators. Seems to be a great risk in Berlin, and they have the additional section going to launch this. Um, the people who were suspects in these cases were on almost all cases part of the group of the Sinti Aroma. These family clans are living in Germany for many years and most of them have the German citizenship at this point. There's obviously no coding here. This is clear calling um, and especially in the first sentence but also in the second. But these family clans are by now living in Germany for many years and are largely um, having German citizenship, like what type of family clans are we talking about in this case? So the um, people who are being uh, under, um, who are being suspects, are they the family clans or like who are the family clans? Like this is, and obviously also the, the hint that like German citizens, they are like, obviously are German citizens, but they want to, they want to kind of enunciate and stress that they are not actually German because they have been living here for a while, but they, they're not actually quite German. I find this quite ultra racist. And we ask ourselves, so why, where does this data come from? Like, so you are taking this data and then you're interpreting or you're not interpreting it and you're writing it, but that's also quite unlawful. So why are you actually uh, collecting this data? What do you want to do with it? And how do you do it? How do you know that somebody's a Sinti and Roma? Do you uh, ask every suspect uh, and about this? Or can you smell this? Um, we're not really sure. Um, so after that, the um, Central Council of Sinti Roma um, started talking to the Minister of the Interior. And they asked the question and they got a response from the interior minister, Arthur Geisel, uh, he would like to uh, um, stress that there is no structural registration. Um, however, there's a bit further um, that it's not based upon whether or not suspects are part of the group of Sinti and Roma, but it is um, made by the experts within the police departments, the professional estimation. And then there's a final uh, thing that they want to enunciate, that they see that it's quite problematic, but they also understand the police understands this is a problematic measure. So there's like very little political pressure that generates any positive outcome. So that's how we came together. So what can we actually do in a lawful way? And that's quite difficult to like get to this. Uh, if you uh, ever deal with racial profiling, it's, you understand it's really complicated. So we have two thoughts. Um, so for um, the data collection, there is, there's clearly like a data protection officer in Berlin and, and we um, filed a complaint and she asked the police a few questions questions in the first round based upon um, what are you making these assumptions. The assumptions are based upon the expertise and again like this is uh, it gets even better. In many many years um, the police has developed this expertise knowledge about specific uh, groups of um, ethnicities. And obviously this is like um, based upon um, investigations of structures of large families and their cultural um, ideas and concepts. So that was the first question round of questions. This was quite vague kind of question and it got a quite vague response. Um, and the um, data protection officer asked another more specific question and um, the data protection officers 
Well, we didn't really see the response yet, otherwise we would have shown it to you guys. Um, we probably would have uh, gotten all our answers in January, we'll know more. Um, so the next step and the next thought, and this is how I want to close, like in Berlin, we have a new law that's being passed, the anti-discrimination law, that is also going to have to be applied to any public office, which gives us a new legal ground and gives us a new tool for organizations such as ours to uh, see how we can um, make like get to the responsibility of the police and the, the responsibility they have and carry. So also in the next year is going to be clearly exciting year. The other subject that we that I uh, chose as an example was um, a case from uh, investigative praxis from the NSU complex. It was oftentimes it's it's kind of swallowed up in the whole subject about this. So it's the the um, murder of um, Michaela Kizaveta. There were mainly Sinti and Roma family that were targeted by the investigation. So what happened in this case? 2007, uh, the police officer. Michelle Kiesewetter was killed in her uh, while being on duty. Um, the police could find a DNA trace. However, the, well, they, they investigated and, and realized that um, it is a female uh, DNA and the police did what they usually do. Um, they checked it against the database from the um, German um, federal, federal Bureau of Investigation of Germany. Um, and they realized that it was showing up in a lot of different places in Germany and, and Austria and France since 1993. So uh, there was large mobility and a lot of um, common offenses. And they also realized from a different subject where this is relevant is um, further DNA analysis uh, was done with the help of Austria and they could understand on a grander scheme what the DNA world exists about and they uh, analyze the bio um, geographical uh, origin of this DNA. And uh, according to the analysis back then, uh, it, there were traces leading, uh, indicating that it was coming from Eastern Europe. All of these uh, findings uh, came to the conclusion that Roma and Sinti became a group of interest in the investigation. And um, all of these came together for the investigators and so they clearly found this DNA trace, female, high mobility, high rate of criminality. Uh, it can obviously only be a Roma or Sinti. The operative uh, case uh, analysis comes to a quite anti-gypsicist conclusion that leads to the traces that the investigators then followed through on and what they focus on. And I will not read all of this, but it is, it's somebody who clearly keeps traveling around, so it's part of the traveling community, lives on the border of society, um, lives a vagabond lifestyle, is, does not belong to a well-established group of society, but only sees its roots in there, um, and definitely has Eastern European or Southern East European um, appear, appearance. So based on this um, case analysis, we can, there's a DNA specific analysis uh, about of um, and part of this analysis was that they asked 3,000 Sinti and Roma to um, supply their DNA to check against the DNA traces that it found. And they were then questioned. This clearly shows how this kind of database um, collection um, is being used in operative measures. And so I, what I did was I, I looked at the file, I looked at the case, and um, investigation case, and in the main case, main file, you can see that against all other groups that were present on the day that the murder took place. So um, everybody that was there was not asked as a witness, but um, they were referred to as uh, Landfahrer, so traveler. So they were all directly categorized as encoded as uh, Sinti and Roma, clearly and their ethnic.
group. So in this file um, itself, we find um, a completely different uh, setup of the file, a lot of long lists of Roma uh, with person, personal data and fingerprints, DNA profiles, you name it, it's in the list. Um, and what exists, what is existing in other uh, cases and files. All right, so we can also find in this file a lot of um, pictures of Roma. Also, you will not find this in any other file. Uh, in any of the other witnesses in this case. All the questioning of the witnesses was completely different to any other witness that was on the ground. It was less about the day itself, but investigators mainly focused in, and this really in the um, tradition of anti-gypsist um, police investigation, we find an overview such as this one, a genealogy about the Roma uh, family, which is a hundred year old tradition. And what really was fascinating for me in this regard was that not only could we find the name, but also find their minority belongings. So that was what used to be called the so called gypsy name. So they would also have their children that, of course, in are not related to the crime scene at all because they were at the time of the crime actually only eight years old. But regardless of this fact, despite all of this, they were they were um, put into the file and and so then I looked at all the investigative measurements they'd taken throughout the whole entire investigation and I try I analyzed this. So there were three hundred. 35 measurements, uh, 176 focused on this phantom trace that they had found of the DNA, so fifths about 52%. These uh, phantom trace two years later was found to be uh, an unreasonable it was a deception because it was actually happened in the lab um, where the, um, the sample was compromised um, and it match the woman who um, packaged the, the swiping uh, things. So after this um, this deception, this uh, this false um, thing was, was clarified, they still focused in on the Sinti and Roma community. And 60% uh, of the whole investigation was focused in on Sinti and Roma. To uh, close this up, before we summarize, I want to uh, mention two more things um, that make quite clear what's going on here. One of them is a measurement where the inside here we can see the guideline to please systematically analyze the papers based upon specific terms and where they use terms such as gypsies and so-called uh, Roma, Sinti or um, similar terms and terminology. So there should be an Excel sheet that should be used for future police work for um, getting DNA profiles from people. Another measurement that I want to um, take a closer look at here is an investigation in uh, Bavaria, Northern Westphalia and uh, Hess and the state of Hess. It's uh, a focus uh, point of this uh, concept of investigation was about traveling perpetrators. Again, this is about Heilbronn. Um, I personally do not know the um, evidence case file, but that's why I, I don't have the full concept of this. But I mean, you don't need enough fantasy to understand what was in there in that file. Uh, Baden-Württemberg, at the end of the day of investigation, said that they took in 15 and 12 15 male and 12 female persons who matched the person 
um, description and, and uh, they were free, uh, freely gave their um, saliva uh, samples. So now we're going to get to our final points. We would like to uh, have like a clear and concrete um, decision about the, like from the in, 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 in Ministry of the Interior um, on the on what is racial profiling and forbidding racial profiling. We actually want uh, control and investigation of by the data protection officials to take a closer look into the police cases and we want a better measurement of controlling and checking this. We want to extend the AGG, so like the discrimination, uh, so there was going to be like a fast law in Berlin to that make discrimination unlawful. We want to extend this. Um, so we also want to make sure that we want to make sure that police is held accountable, also using the courts. And then in addition to this, we'd also like this topic of anti-gypsyism to have a broader societal alliance behind it, rather than always being um, something that is being pushed by the people who are affected by it and who are already the victims of this anti-gypsyism. In addition to that, I think there needs to be into investigations into what has happened and what police have done so far and into policing practice as it's happening today. Um, I think um, we also will allow a few questions. Um, so for the stuff that we will not be able to, to talk about in the next few minutes because of timing issues, we also have a stall in the rights and freedom area with the civil society, um, with our civil society organization. Um, so it's kind of in that rights and freedom area. So um, unfortunately, the Central Council does not have a stall, but you should come and visit us and talk to us. So yeah, we'll take questions. All right, we have a few more minutes left for questions. There's mic one, two, and three. Please just go there and ask your questions if you have them. If you don't, I will ask the internet if there's a question. Do we have questions from the internet? Okay, I see there is a question from the internet. Hi, the question from the internet is, if you, whether you have suggestions how to prevent this racist categorization but still keep operative measurements up. Oh, uh, well, that's an interesting question because the assumption is that the operative capacity will be limited if you stop being racist. Um, I think this marker, this marking of people as Sinti and Roma that has to be racist, that has to disappear from the databases, and then police needs to engage with the fact that this kind of causal linkage of association with a particular ethnic group um, being associated with um, a probability, propensity for committing crimes, that's something that is absolutely not an option, not acceptable, and that is racism. So if there's a specific description of a one particular person, that may be okay, but to assume that in particular cases for particular crimes, you need to look for people based on their their looks and the color of their skin and can enact operative measures on people, members of a particular ethnic community, that's absolutely untrue. And I think, in my opinion, the opposite is the case. Yeah, Leah already said it and summarized it well. In my opinion, as association and membership in an ethnic group cannot be a reason for investigation and cannot be a way of approaching police investigations. People do not commit crimes because they are part of a particular ethnic group. Every individual is responsible for their own actions and that has nothing to do which ethnic group uh, those people belong to or the suspect belongs to. And what's important, so the last point that Leah already mentioned, we really need a change in thinking and in political, pra in terms of political practice. It's not enough for them to just relabel everything again and to become more creative and just use different terms to continue the same racist practice. Um, but it has to be clear that association and membership of a particular ethnic group has nothing to do with what a person does. I'm so sorry. I think we're out of time for the questions. Thank you so much. You have probably have the option to talk to them after this session. In this sense, uh, give them a good final applause. Thank you so much for listening in to also. Um,